Good morning. We're going to kick right in and enjoy the presence of the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask you just to stand. And uh, man, thanks for joining us at Midtown Church. I'm excited about what God's doing in, in, in this city and in each of our lives and, and what, he, what He wants to do today. I, this morning in my early quiet time, I'm praying and, and I really did. I checked this out. I want you to know that today God is in a good mood. He's in a good mood today, and 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 he and he wants to he wants to express himself in a fresh way, some way we not really ever recognized him. So I just encourage you in our worship today, whether you're familiar with our style of worship or this is new to you, whatever happens in, in the next part of your day, and we pray that this is the most refreshing part of your week. Whatever happens, I just pray that you'll you'll allow the Lord to show him so show a new dimension of himself to you. There'll be something brand new when you leave here today it won't be it won't be the same because this multi-dimensional God showed up and showed you who he is Father right now I thank you that we we have an incredible privilege uh, to worship you and I pray you receive our worship uh, from every heart Lord whatever the journey is that's brought us here this morning you are you're you're deeply involved and you are you are certainly concerned and your eyes are on us today and so i pray that in our our act of worship you feel free to reveal a new dimension of yourself to each one of us that we just can leave here at, we can't help but express the glory and the freedom that our jesus brings us so lord just bless us with your presence and receive our worship in our human form our our best effort to lift you up will you receive that today thank you for being our god i love you lord bless our worship team and their hard work and preparation for today love you jesus amen oh taste and see that the lord is good oh taste and see that the Lord is good to me. You've turned my morning into dancing. Put off my rags, clothe me with gladness, and I will arise. I will praise you. I'll we'll sing and not be silent. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good to me. You turn my morning into dance. Put off my rest. Clothe me with light. And I will arise, I will praise, I'll sing and not be silent, yeah. Cause oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever, oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you.
we're believers that you are great this morning. That you're greater than our, our struggles. You're greater than our deficiencies. You're greater than our mistakes. We're blessed to be in your presence this morning. We serve a, a great God that is so interested and involved in your life and in your situations. There's times in our life where we come up against situations, we come up against circumstances where we're, we really don't know what to do. We, we feel like uh, our abilities and, and, and our efforts aren't good enough, aren't, aren't strong enough to, to find success in these challenges. I was reading my Bible yesterday and I read this story that uh, this guy Jehoshaphat, a great king, in the Old Testament came up against one of those situations where where he didn't have the ability to overcome the trial, the, the, the struggle. And I love what, what he responded. I want to read to you this, this story in 2 Chronicles 20. And then we're going to spend a couple more minutes just seeking Jesus and worshiping and praying together. But in 2 Chronicles, we see uh, there's, there's five armies attacking Jehoshaphat and his army. And he realizes that uh, this is too much, that they don't have the ability to win this battle, to win this war. And uh, it, it, as you read the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it says, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, and he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard of the temple of the Lord, and he prayed. It says he was freaked out about his situation. So he came together with people at church, at the temple, and he began praying. He says, this is his prayer, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God in heaven. You are the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, you did not, did you not drive out those who lived in the land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. I love right here the, the, the content of Jeho Jehoshaphat's prayer. It says he comes before God, and, and his prayer is incredible. He says nothing of their efforts, of their ability, but only the promises of God. You see, his confidence was not in their efforts, in their abilities, or their inabilities. His confidence was found in the promises of God. And in his prayer, it isn't, God, here's our mess, here's our struggle, here's what we can do. He says, God, this is your promises, this is your fight, this is your battle. And he comes to him and he doesn't say anything of their efforts. He doesn't pray for strength. He doesn't pray for greater abilities. He says, God, I'm, I'm handing this situation, this difficulty over to you. Yeah. Continues in verse 10. It says, And now see, the armies of Ammon, and Moab, Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they have rewarded us. For you have come... For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. Another translation says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I love this because when our abilities, when my abilities, when your abilities fall short, and we don't know what to do about our situation, the answer, the solution isn't in just striving harder and working harder and being more disciplined. Our solution is taking our eyes off of our deficiency and placing them on the sufficiency of Jesus. Since we don't know what to do, we're powerless, we're weak. I don't have what it takes. So rather than just asking for greater levels of strength in my life, rather than focusing on my insufficiency, our eyes need to transfer to the sufficiency of Jesus. His completed work, His grace, His good news for you. It says this in verse 13. It goes on to say that uh, they pray and that they gather together before the Lord. And they hear this word from God that says there's going to be victory, that you can go, you can fight this battle, you can 
you can walk forward in this. It says so after they get this good news in verse 18, Josephat gets people around them, they bow down, and they, they, they pray, and it says they begin to worship the Lord. It says they began to sing. It says early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa on the way. Josephat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising Him for His splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise to the Lord, the Lord caused all the armies to begin fighting amongst themselves. The moment they began to sing, the moment they began to, to take their eyes off of their insufficiencies and worship the goodness of God, they were still facing an army too big for them. They were still facing a situation that was overwhelming them. But when they stopped talking about how bad things were, and they started looking at how good God was, the moment they began singing and worshiping and elevating their God, He shows up, the enemy starts fighting themselves, and we see they show up to the battle. And when they show up, they're expecting this overwhelming, catastrophic war. But what they find was a victory that they didn't even have to work for. That in our lives, the areas that seem impossible for us in our efforts, the solution is there, but it's not in us fighting harder. The solution is there when our eyes get fixed on Jesus. When we look to Him to victory and when we show up to the battle, when we're ready to fight, the victory is won and it's not because of how hard we worked. It's because of where we looked. That your victory has far more to do with what you're looking at than how hard you're trying. This is the goodness. This is the grace of Jesus. It goes on to say that, that as they, they walk down and they see this, this great victory, they see the armies that have been beaten when they didn't even have to fight for one minute. It says it took them three days to gather the plunder. What they expected was to, to lose a lot of life, to lose a lot of, of men. But what they got was so much plunder, it says it took them three days to collect. Which is dripping with analogy to Jesus and the blessing of what happened three days after he was in the grave and, and he comes forward and the blessing is so great and, and they have this, this celebration in the valley of blessing after three days. And today what we want to do in these next few moments together is I don't know what baggage you brought in here. I don't know what the army's attacking you are. I don't know what it is that overwhelms your mind at night when it feels like you're, you're insufficient to the challenge. Or that relationship, or that financial issue, or, or, or that job, or that sickness is overwhelming you. That, that, that temptation, that addiction is, is far too great. That bitterness and pain from the past. I want to tell you that your victory this morning has less to do with your efforts and far more to do with where you're looking. And when we come together, like Jehoshaphat and his people, in the temple, in the church, and we begin praying together. And we begin singing and worshiping and lifting up God. And we take our eyes off of our weakness. And we take our eyes off of our problems. And we fix them on the goodness and the grace of Jesus. Something changes. And it wasn't your efforts. It was God ready to move in your situation. And that you may expect challenges, but God wants to bring victory. We're going to worship in one more song. And Peter's going to lead us. And as we do, our challenge to you is not just to think about what you can do better. It's not to pray, God, give me more strength. Your prayer is, is not, well, well, I just, I'm, I'm going to have to get more discipline in my life, God. God, show me how I can improve. Because victory doesn't come from your works, no matter how good they are. Victory comes from your gaze. We're going to look to Jesus. We're going to say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what I need to overcome this situation. But I'm going to stop looking at that. I'm going to just look at you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to seek you. We would love to join you in prayer. If there's a situation in your life that, that, that we could join you with, we're going to ask you during this next song, if you just move forward, come up here somewhere up the front, and we're going to have someone join you in prayer. 
let's take a few moments. We're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, who is ready to see victory in your challenge, who's ready to see victory in your deficiencies. His sufficiency is going to show up. Peter, would you take us? And we're going to pray. I want to invite you even now, if, if there's an area we can join you with, would you just make your way to the front? If there's not an area you would like us to join you with, would you take this moment and realign your focus, realign your gaze, fix your eyes on Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. So to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the man who was slain. Holy, holy is he. So to him sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, 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 Son of God Almighty, it was in his days to come. So
daughter Charlie comes to me and, and of her own free will, out of the blue, just expresses her love for me. Just the simple, hey dad, I love you. It's one thing when I, I say it to her first and she responds, and it's nice and I enjoy it, but that unexpected, just she initiates a love you thing is one of the most rewarding things in the world. And I think that's a... Uh, you know, it's so cool when, when we can just talk about God's love for us. And we can't love Him if it weren't for His love for us. His love is first. His love is primary. It has nothing to do with, with our loving efforts towards Him to earn anything. But one of the coolest things we can do as His children is to just, in our own words, not, not because we're repeating what He said, just tell Him we love Him. And I want to take the next 30 seconds. And you can do it quietly. You can do it just in your mind, you can do it out loud, you can do this however you're comfortable. But in 30 seconds, we're just going to in our own words, not words on a screen, not something that we're repeating together, but in your own hearts, we're just going to express your love, your gratefulness to God, His, His gift to you, His grace to you. Just express it to Him in your own hearts.
we know that your love was first and that we, we love because you love first. But we do love. We are grateful for you. I pray that uh, if there are those here today who, who haven't fallen in love with you yet, that haven't seen a proper picture of your grace towards them, I pray that today would be that day. There wouldn't be some religious ceremony or or moments, but there would just be that that realization of how how good you are, how real your love is. And our our only response in fallen humanity is is love back towards you, is gratefulness for your grace and your provision. Father, I thank you that this morning our victories don't come from our own efforts. I thank you that uh, that we don't have to rely on our insufficiencies, our weaknesses, our pains, our troubles. But we can direct our gaze to your grace in Jesus that is more than enough. That though we don't deserve it, it's available. Let that be what we seek, what we pursue, what we rely on. And that we see amazing victory in lives simply because you're that good. We thank you for your good news. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you that you're pouring out your love on us. And our only response is to lift you up. You're a great God this morning. We love you. Thanks for what you're going to speak into our hearts in the coming moments. It's in your name we're here together and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment as we are transitioning service here and would you greet somebody around you, introduce yourself if there's a face you're unfamiliar with, uh, but would you say hi to those around you, give some handshakes, some hugs, some high fives, some introductions if necessary, but we're blessed to have you here at Michigan this morning. Well, good morning again. Man, isn't it exciting just to hang out with Jesus for a while? Thank you. Man, what an exciting season we're in and what God is doing, and I'm thrilled. And and we're going to transition into our act of worship of offering this morning, of, of the Lord's tithe and our offering uh, this morning. And, and, uh, and, and I just want to show you, I just want to very quickly show you how when we when we obey the Lord and in, in His tithe, and we honor the Lord in our offerings, when we do that, when we when we do the Lord's tithe and our offerings, it makes us more like Jesus, and that's the goal, right? Amen. We're supposed we want to, and at the end of the day, we want to be like Jesus. And and Paul says in in Second Corinthians, he says, "I say to you, he who sows sparingly reaps sparingly." And then he goes on and says, and it's a principle. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, God loves us to be cheerful in our giving because that shows Him we're becoming more like Him because He's a God who's excited about giving. He likes to give. It, it, it brings cheer to Him. It brings joy to Him. He loves to bless His kids. And so when we give with the same motive, it shows Him we're becoming more like Him. And so when we give the Lord's tithe and our offering, we are actually showing that we are becoming like Jesus. And then He says, He says, watch this. Um, let's not give grudgingly or out of necessity, but for God lives a cheerful giver. There's so much to learn here. God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always have sufficiency in all things and have abundance. Now listen, here's what we do. Notice it says in there not to give out of necessity. Okay, don't give out of necessity. But then he says but that we would give, but God loves a cheerful giver. Here, here's the deal. Sometimes we can look at our checkbook and determine that we're going to give based on our necessity. 
But the Bible says that Jesus looked at the cross and he went through that necessity because of the joy that he knew was on the other side. So in our, in our obedience to the Lord, in our obedience of, of tithing, in our obedience of offering, we're not to give out of our, that should not be based on what are my needs. It should be based on looking through the cross at the joy that's on the other side. When I do this, it makes me more like Jesus. And, and that's, that, man, that's, that, that's motive enough to give. If, if giving in the Lord's tithe and your offering makes you more like Jesus, wow, that's, that is a great motive. Not out of necessity, but out of a cheerful heart because we're becoming more like our Jesus. Let's have our guys come forward. I want to pray over, over our, our offering and uh, just allow the Lord to, to bless you. And remember the promise, sowing sparingly, you promise you will reap, but it will be sparingly. You sow bountifully. I did a study on that word bountifully one time. The Lord tells us to have a bountiful eye. And that means that we're to have an eye that, 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 that uh, the things that we see are too big for our eye to and behold. And uh, so when we give, we're too big for us to, to, to be able to, to behold. He, re, he blesses us with too much for us to behold. Father, thank you for the amazing spirit of the Lord this morning. Thank you for great worship. Thank you uh, that we get to worship you through your tithe and our offering. And I just ask you this morning to put special favor. Let us see uh, our, ourselves changing to be like you. Lord, I pray that we don't give out of necessity. I pray that we give because we want to be like Jesus. And we want to have cheerful hearts. And we want to be encouragers and, and meet the needs of those around us. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for, for, for everyone that serves at Midtown Church. And that we get to be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Well, while they're serving you, um, just to, I want to give you one uh, quick announcement um, today. And that is, listen, Financial Peace University, FPU, started on Wednesday nights a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so you might be saying, gee, I wish I had started it. Well, the, the good news, you still can. Let me encourage you, uh, this Wednesday night is uh, probably the, the, the most uh, energizing and and uh, encouraging teaching on finances you will ever hear. If you have not been here the last two Wednesdays, it is not too late. Uh, we have 56 people going through our current class. Uh, since, since Midtown has uh, been offering Financial Peace University classes, I was told this week by Brandon, who leads those classes, that since, since those classes have been provided uh, in the two years, two full years now, three years, in three years, uh, just through the people that have gone through Financial Peace University at Midtown Church, um, we have seen over a million dollars of debt paid off in three years. Amen. Amen. So I'm telling you, uh, it's a principle. It's a godly principle. If you're not a part of the current nine-week series, it's not too late. Get here this Wednesday at 7 and, and get, in my opinion, what I think is the most enthusiastic, energy-driven uh, lesson on, on how to really just crush debt. And, and live in freedom. So please be here. Hey, we've been on a series the last few weeks on the heart of community, on, 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 on the, that we would, we would be a place, a, a church that, that understands the heart of community, that we would be a people that understands the heart of community, and, and that, 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 that uh, this family and, and our church would become more than a weekly appointment, but that this family and this church would become uh, the community that we not only believe in and come alongside of and invest in, but the community we love bringing people that don't know community into. And, and, and so we're, we've been on this journey. Um, I'm not going to review a lot, but just to remind you, this, this whole idea of community and the explosiveness of what God can do in, a, in the heart of community started in Acts with 120 people up in an upper room. And, and the, here's what's encouraging to me about that. Listen to me, this is what's encouraging to me. There's 120 people that were untrained, uneducated, ha, had a, a, a bucket full of failures, um, a, just a mixed bag of, of careers that were going on. They, they had just experienced a horrible loss in their life. They, they were confused. 120 people that were just like me. It's 
so cool. And that 120 people that were just like me said, we're going to create a community and we're going to live in the heart of that community. And because they made that decision to create community, you and I get to be here today and be a part of this crazy thing called Christianity. And, and, and man, I'm blessed with that, that small 120 people, that church, they didn't have a building. They didn't have near the worship team we got going on. Really? That's your best? They, they, didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have any place to rent. They were in a borrowed place. They were praying for something. They didn't know what they were praying for. They, they didn't really even know what church was. They knew what synagogue was. They know what church was. And, and this, this, just this group of 120 small church, didn't own a building, untrained failures, came together and created community. And, and we've been on that journey. And today I want to, I, 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 I've been asking you each week, uh, why, why, why are you a part of Midtown? And, and what keeps you at Midtown? And what invited you to Midtown? And, 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 and I've received so many emails and encouraging notes of, 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 of what's going on in people's lives and why they're here and, and, uh, and the, the, the joy they have and the relationships they have. And, and, and it's been so cool. And, and it's been encouraging. But this week, I want, I'm not going to give you any kind of, I don't believe, any kind of life changing, eye opening revelation today. I want to send you out of here today with just four basic principles, just really simple, fundamental principles of, of, of how do we do, how do, how do we, how do we live this out? How do we sustain community? How do we, how do we pass on community? Why, why was that so successful 3,000 years ago? And, and still today, we're, we're a part of it. How, what, what keeps it fresh? How do you, I don't know, let, let me just ask a question, just be honest for a minute. Uh, we're all family. You ever, you ever struggle keeping your walk with Jesus fresh? Not letting it get stale? <laughs> Is, I mean, you ever, you, ever, you ever battle with that? And I'm not, I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm not talking, I'm just talking about Fresh. I'm talking about getting up in the morning and cannot wait to meet with Jesus. And sometimes it's really get up in the morning. It's like, oh, I have to read the Bible. Just being real, huh? Sometimes we get up in the morning and we do this. Ah, oh, I slept in. I'm running late. I'll. I'll do it tonight. Yeah. Then the office comes on. And you think if you can watch the office, you'll go to bed a little early. Yeah, right. Because you got to flip the ESPN and get a 30-minute update on what happened that day. And you can do, fall into that stretch for a few days. And then I'm not talking about sin or backsliding or being evil. I'm just saying... Sometimes we got to work keeping our walk with Jesus fresh. And, and sometimes we can come into church, we can come into this community and feel like nobody else struggles with that. So it, I don't want to be real. I can't be transparent. I'm, I'm less than. I won't measure up. These people all seem to have it together. <laughs> These people, are, they got it going on. If you knew, <laughs> I don't want to insult you. I can say, if you knew the losers you were sitting next to. <laughs> but, I mean, was that bad? Was that a bad thing to say? Oh, yeah, you're by your wife. Never mind. Th th don't. Yeah. But listen, so, so today I just want to give us some, just some, just some real fundamental, basic four-point sermon, which isn't my usual habit, of how do we do this? How do we really do this? We've, for, for, for weeks we've talked about it, but how do we do it? Listen, it's important that we do it, and not just for us, it's important that we do it. This week, I read an article, the Billy Graham Association, which in my opinion is a pretty reputable association. Uh, Billy Graham Association uh, read, read an uh, article in a magazine that the Billy Graham Association um, uh, says that 5%, listen to this, 5% of Christians share their faith or actively initiate Christian growth 
in their daily communities. 5%. 5% of Christians really try to increase their community in their daily lives, in the circles that are in their daily lives. That, that's, that, that's, that's a travesty to me. When, that really amazes me that that's really the number when we really have a cool message. We really have a great message. We really have the most amazing, life-changing message ever created. We have, we have God. We have God. And He loves us. And it's a great story. And I know many of your stories. And He's transformed lives. And He's pulled us out of addiction. And set us free from abusive situations. And renewed our vision. And gave us a sense of purpose. And we got this excitement about life. And there's something that makes me want to love people like I never have. And I no longer judge others. Because I, I know what it's like to feel like I'm judged. And so I don't judge anymore. And, and I got this great story. And 5% of us do something with it. So it, it says to me that there's kind of a struggle. Maybe, maybe maybe we don't have the ABC of how to do this. So I'm not going to operate on an assumption. I'm going to give us four points. I'm not really good at four-point sermons. I don't know what to call them. Four really good ideas on how to live out community. And listen, number one, I want you to get this if, if you're taking notes. Listen, number one, if we're going to live out community, we, we personally, we have to live... We have to live a life that, that, that is a life that, that, that loves God and loves people. Now, that's a cliche statement. But we need to live a life that honors God and loves people. We need to live a life that honors God and loves people. Listen, it's really easy to hear that and go, you're right, Pastor, that, that makes sense. But that really, that means every day. That means through the high times and through the low times. That means every day. There's, there's times in our lives where we just have to grit our teeth, walk through the muck that we're in, because guess what? Somebody is watching you and seeing if you're honoring God in that low part of your life. And if what you got has any kind of stability to it, is there any meat to it, is there any strength to it, does it really matter to you? And then they're going to watch you in the good times. And how do you celebrate those? Do they become selfish, all about me? Or do you enjoy bringing others into your victory? And let's celebrate this together. Because I promise you, there is, listen, there's not one decision in your life that you make or one victory in your life that you make that hasn't been influenced by someone. And we don't think that through. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say after we get done eating here, one of you loves me and wants to buy me who hot. Okay. So we make a plan and you and I, we meet at who hot. And the waiter comes up to the table and says, can I help you? And we say, yeah, I would like a glass of, of uh, Arnold Palmer and some rice and some tortillas and some ranch dressing. you got to have ranch. And amen. And, and, and so that waiter says, okay, I'll do that. And, and they walk away and somehow they mysteriously come back and they got rice and they got tortillas, and they got your drink, and they got ranch, and 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 let me tell you something. Your decision. Somebody, somebody hired that waiter. Somebody, before you went there and paid for a meal, so the owner of the place could pay the waiter that waited on you. Somebody went before that guy and paid for their meal to help pay so the owner could order more rice. And, and when that rice was ordered, it, it blessed somebody who sells rice. And that somebody that sells rice now made enough money to hire somebody to help them harvest the rice. And that somebody that just harvested the rice has a wife and a child to go home to and take care of their needs. So let me tell you something. There's not a decision that you make in this life that doesn't influence someone or isn't influenced by someone. So if you're not willing to invite someone in to help celebrate your victories, you're selfish. And that's not community. Community is who are you in the low times and do you invite people to help you celebrate in the high? See, everywhere Jesus went, people followed him. They, they, and gathered. Crowds grew. Why? I mean, think about that. Why? Why? Because I'm, I'm convinced because good stuff happened. No matter where he went, crippled people walk and 
free lunch. And, 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 and the dead people get, get raised and, and, and the religious people get scolded. And, and it was just every day I was like, well, this is a cool adventure. And, and it just grew. I really doubt, I really doubt that, that in that day, anybody, as that crowd grew, I really doubt that any one of his followers came up and, 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 and said, dude, listen, there's this guy, Jesus. Now listen, listen. You need to repent of your sins, and you need to you need to clean up a little bit, bro. You just need to clean up. And uh, let me tell you how to act when you're around him, because there's some protocol. And uh, so after you get that together, you, you need to come meet this. I don't think that happened. I think it was, there's this dude, and that's all I need to tell you. Because like everywhere he goes, something happens. Everywhere he goes, he walks through accusations and he walks through people trying to tear him down and he walks through people trying to steal from him and he walks through prostitutes being thrown in his path and tempt him and the dude is constant it's amazing and every time that dude comes into a victory he invites me to be a part of it see we we got to live god honoring lives that also love people so open your bibles to acts chapter 3 and 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 listen I'll give you a little background. The, the disciples, the disciples uh, are, are going on in life. They're headed to the they're headed to the church to pray on this day in Acts chapter three verse one. They're going to the church to pray and and do what they do, and uh, and 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 we're picking up Peter and John are kind of cruising, heading into the church in Acts three one. Uh, it says Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried. Man, there's so much in here. I, I'm not going to take it a time to tell you all it's in here, but Monday, one day we might come back to it. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. Get that? Guy is crippled from birth. That's all he knows. All he knows. And he's carried to the temple, to the gate called Beautiful, every day. Every day. He was put there to beg those going into the temple courts. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. Now, I love, I don't know about your Bibles, but mine has an exclamation point right there. So I'm, I'm like, I just get this picture of this big old burly Peter just getting in that boy's grill. And, you know, exclamation point. Look at me! Can you imagine that? Poor little guy. <laughs> Been lame all his life, get dropped off at the same gate every day, every day. People just walk by him every day. He's begging, and finally this one big burly fisherman goes, Look at me! Okay. So the man so the man gave him his attention, no doubt. Expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now let's take a little time out there. Let me tell you, church. We can provide for this community great counseling. We can provide clothing for the homeless. We can provide food for the hungry. We can provide every social need and every felt need. We can provide disciplines for financial needs. We can provide all those felt needs. But I'm going to tell you something. If that's all we provide, we have given them nothing. Our first provision has to be the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. That's where these guys started. Look at me. This guy, Jesus, has something for you. The guy's been there his whole life. His social needs have been met his whole life. His begging has got him through his whole life. His food was met by begging his whole life. And But somebody, one day, two guys stopped and said, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm going to live a God-honoring, people-loving life. Verse 7, watch this. It says, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Let me look, look at the imagery there. As in community, listen church, in community, we have got to get past lip service. Follow what this says. We have got to get past telling people, I just, I just want you to know, Micah, dude, I just want you to know God loves you, dude. I just, God, God loves you. Have a good day, bro. You know what that Bible says? The Bible says that he told him about Jesus and then he reached into his life. And he said, I'm just going to give you lip service. Let me, let me take you by the right hand. 
Let, let, me, let me get some of your dirt on me. Let, let, me, let, me, let me take some of what you're carrying. Let, let everybody else in this church see that I'm hanging out with the crippled dude that begs every day. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not just going to... Sorry, man. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Why can't I pick someone serious? I need someone serious. So... But, but he, he says that he told him about Jesus and then he just reached into his life. He didn't, he didn't just give him the quick lip service. Oh, I've been inviting people to church all my life, Pastor. Really? Have you reached into their life? Do you know what their kids are struggling with? Do you have any idea what their wife's addictions are? Do you have any idea what their financial standing is? Do you, do, do you have any idea how they need someone just to come over and fix a few things around the house? Do you have any idea how lonely they might feel at night because they are divorced and they don't have their children around? Really? Have you reached into their life and helped them stand up? Or are you just giving them lip service? See, if we're going to build community, Midtown, we've got to get past this and start doing this. You with me? And did you see what happened? When he reached into his life, the lame guy's ankle... And knees didn't heal until somebody reached into his life. Peter and John had every right to just walk right on by the brother. And they probably had in the past. And even after they said, man, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk and keep moving. They did their job. But the healing didn't come until somebody took them time to reach into his life and help him. That's community. That's a, that's a loving God or an honoring God, loving people kind of life. And Midtown, come on, we got to get past lip service. This city has enough lip service. I really believe, and, and, and I'm sure that I could be argued with by, by, by probably the liberal standing, but I really do believe, I really am, am foolish enough to believe that everyone in this city knows God loves them. They just haven't seen it happen. I'm, you're not an atheist. I don't believe that. I believe that you know God loves you. But unfortunately, you haven't seen it happen. He took him by the right hand and helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he, whoa, watch this. This is good. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Now listen, you've got to see what just happened here. He went into the temple courts, walking, get that, and jumping and praising God. Do you see the full healing there? you see the healing there? He got healed physically. He was walking. He got healed emotionally. He started jumping. And he got healed spiritually. He started praising God. He had a multiple healing because one person reached into his life. Think about what, what happened there. Have you ever been to a grocery store? I have six children. I know this happens. You ever been to a grocery store or any store or any place in public and you have that child that's about that age where they just jump. They just, they're just all over the place. You cannot keep track of them. You, in fact, you, 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 you're wondering if the only name you know is Tommy. Tommy, no. Tommy, don't. Tommy, Tommy, come, Tommy, come back here. Tommy, stop it. Tommy. You, everybody in the store knows, you know, that guy's got a kid named Tommy. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, you go through those stages of life, it's like, we're never going to a store again. Because this kid jumps. He jumps in the cart. He jumps out of the cart. He jumps over stuff. He jumped. Did you see that one lady? He jumped between her legs. She almost fell over. Uh, we're not going to the store ever again. You get in the car and you tell your kid, until you're 22, don't you ever think you're going to the store with me again. Don't we do that? And then you drive home and you blindly swing in the back seat hoping you connect. The truth of the matter is we kind of expect it. We kind of expect kids to jump and be crazy. But this, this guy, this guy goes to church and starts jumping around. He's jumping around. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> oh boy, here he goes. Jesus just touched my life. <laughs> and, and he's going, yeah, I'm healed. And here's what we do in the church. You stop drawing attention to yourself right now. Really? Wow. 
wouldn't it be great if Midtown was a place where the unchurched had people reaching them into their lives, bringing them along, and they start, started running around like crazy? I mean, we could set up rules. Everybody run the same way. But yeah. <laughs> Stop lights down the aisle. Stop. <laughs> when all the people saw him, I'm in verse 9, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They were filled with wonder. What does that mean? They started asking, how'd that happen? What? Look at that guy. That's the guy that used to beg. And now, look at him. He's like a kid in the shopping market. What happened? Listen, we have a responsibility. First Peter 3.15. This is our responsibility. This is very important that we get this. First Peter 3.15. It says this. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. And then I love this. Always be prepared. Watch what this says. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always prepared. That means in advance, before you encounter the situation, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope. People, listen to me, people aren't going to ask you about your hope if they don't see you got some. If you're not living like you got hope, no one's going to ask you, bro, what's up? Why are you always so happy? What's, how come you got so much joy? I see this growing in your life and you always seem to just walk through it. It just bounces off you like Teflon. Why? Well, I'm always prepared to give an answer for the hope when people ask If we're really going to live a God-honoring, people-loving life, it can't just be in the high times. It can't just be in the quiet closet. It has to be every day, all day, everyone we meet, we influence them towards Jesus. We influence them towards Jesus. We just influence them towards Jesus. When I laid my head down tonight, that it influenced my wife towards Jesus. That influenced my kids towards Jesus. That influenced the police officer that wrote me the ticket towards Jesus. I didn't get one. But did I influence every person I met towards Jesus today? Just in case somebody said, what's the hope that you have? Because I always want to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that I have. How can you love those people that aren't like you? I just have this hope that God's going to turn them around. You with me? I'm going to skip some of my scripture. Just go to Acts 4.13. Can you do that for me? For the sake of time. The story goes on and, and Peter starts telling to the people when they're asking what's happening, he realizes that they're starting to look at Peter and John thinking they did it. And Peter says, no, it wasn't us at all. This guy Jesus that you killed, the guy that raised people from the dead, that guy Jesus uh, that you killed, uh, he's alive. And then he makes this amazing statement. Because see, we can read that and think that Peter was getting after him. That guy Jesus... You killed? He's alive. He's going to smoke you. But then Peter ends that, that statement with this. He says, we're all witnesses. We. He did it for all of us. And then Acts 4.13, it says, And when they saw the courage and the Peter of John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, They were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. Is there a better reputation? Unschooled, ordinary men. Yet there was an astonishment that they'd been with Jesus. Because they lived God-honoring, people-loving lives. 
Well, the second, the second point I want to give you is, is listen, if we're going to live a God-honoring, people-loving life, we need to be really careful of what kind of reputation we give Jesus. See, Peter, in everything he did from that point on, pointed towards Jesus. But look at Acts 3, 16. Watch what he says here. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. What did it give him? A complete healing. For what? For everyone to see. Listen, you got to be careful what kind of a reputation you give Jesus. If, that, if on the job, you're the one that complains all the time, you're the one that gossips all the time, you're the one that slams your boss all the time, you're the one that complains all the time, don't be telling people you love Jesus. And in community, if that's who you are on the job, then that's the reputation you're giving the Midtown community. Come on. Who, who, who are you pointing at? What, what does your mouth point towards? What does your life point towards? Listen, we, we go through stuff in life where, where people have hurt us and have taken advantage of us and discouraged us and disappointed us and, and failed us. And, and, and it is really easy to sit down and go tell people of how bad those people are that did those bad things to us. And I'm not discounting bad things. Bad things. Abuse and neglect and hurt and lies and discouragement. That, that happens. That stuff happens. I'm not, I'm not demeaning the pain. But I am, am telling you that if... If in that pain, you're still unable to point to Jesus, you don't understand community. Because you're giving Jesus a reputation. I wonder, I wonder how many of us would want to hire um, someone. No, would, not even hire. Don't, I don't know about you. I str- don't you struggle hanging out with people that just have the, the Eeyore mentality? No, woe is me. Hey, Eeyore. Yeah. Good morning. Oh, what's so good about it? Bro, it's a brand new day. Oh, I don't know. I've been up an hour and I'm not feeling too good yet. Oh, the, the Eeyore? Eeyore, wow! Nice shirt! Oh, just something I threw on. I mean, they, they come into a room and, and, and the, you've just completely painted the room and rearranged the furniture and shampooed the carpet for the Eeyore. Look at the... Oh, I think you missed a spot. You know? I mean, that, that Eeyore... You, Eeyore, wow! It, man, it, i got to tell you... You've been, you've been looking good. It looks like you're losing weight. Oh, thanks for noticing. Just don't feel like eating anymore. <laughs> really? I mean, who? And then they come up to you. Well, Micah, you probably won't care, but I went to church and, well, Jesus loves you. Like, dude, that's good news. That looks like you have hope. And I know I'm being facetious, but listen, man, we got to be careful what kind of a reputation we give Jesus. we got to be careful with that. Now listen, number one, we need to live God-honoring lives and we, need to love, and we need to love people. And secondly, we need to be careful of the reputation we give to Jesus. But third, we need to be really insightful. We need to be really insightful of what, of what the root of people's real issues are. It's really easy. It is really easy to, to, to assume it's really easy to judge. It's really easy to, to, to go into situations before you ever get into them and you know what's going to happen because you know what kind of people they are. Watch what happens in verse 17 of Acts chapter 3. Watch this incredible statement. Now watch what Peter says. This is amazing. These are the guys that killed Jesus. These are the guys that are watching the lame man get healed. These are the guys that are religious. Three o'clock every day we're in the church. Ignore the beggar. These are the guys, he's in church, just told them, you're the dudes that killed Jesus. You're the dudes that messed the whole thing up. And then he says in verse 17, Brothers, you know what? We've all messed up. 
He, he brings them in. You know what? We're family here. I'm not judging you. I'm not beating you down. I'm not telling you you're some kind of loser. You're my brother. And I love the way he finishes his statement. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. He didn't say, listen, I know that you acted out of rebellion. I know that you knew better. I know that your mama taught you better than that. He said, you know what, my brother? I get it. You just didn't know. What you did, you did out of ignorance. Listen, church, let, 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 let's be a community. Let, let's be a, a community where we assume ignorance over rebellion. Did you get that? I want that to sink in. I'm not saying excuse poor behavior. I'm not saying erase consequences. No, the real sin is bad and consequences need to be paid and I get all that. But, but when we're going into a situation where we're building community, let's assume ignorance over rebellion. Come on. Let's just... Isn't that a lot easier? Just to assume maybe they don't really know the truth. Maybe those people that killed Jesus really didn't know that's what they were doing. We need to, we need to be deliberate about recognizing the root of, of people's issues. You know, I, I ask you, have you ever been ignorant about anything? Somebody said, no. Somebody's ignorant right now. <laughs> you ever been ignorant about something and somebody brings it to your attention and you're like, Pah! are you, I had no idea. That's what I feel like when tools are involved. A screwdriver does that? <laughs> no way. I didn't know it did this. I thought it was a hammer. You ever been ignorant? I love that. My brothers, I know that you're acting in ignorance. And, and your leaders, they taught you to do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reach into your life. I'm not just going to give you lip service. And I'm going to stand you up. And I'm going to go into church. I'm going to go into life with you. And when people start saying, are you kidding me? Do you know who Micah is? Why do I keep picking on you? When people start saying, do you, are you, do you know who Micah is? I'm able to say, yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, he's my brother. And sometimes he makes decisions out of ignorance. But between here and there, he's been restored. He's got a complete healing. That builds community. Well, last of all, Peter, if you want to come up, last thing I want to tell you about building a community, and this is what's really cool. If we're going to build a community at Midtown Church, it's got to be a community where every day we live God-honoring, people-loving lives. And if we're going to build a community at Midtown Church, not only every day do we need to live God-honoring, people-loving lives, but we've got to realize what kind of a reputation we're giving Jesus in this community. And not only do we need to live God-honoring, people-loving lives and understand what kind of a reputation we're giving Jesus, but we need to understand people are ignorant and don't know. But here's the cool part. Here's, here's the fuel for that. The last principle I want to give you is nobody has to stay ignorant. Nobody has to stay there. See, we need to share the way we became community. Acts 3.19 says this. I'm going to read Acts 3.19 out of the NIV. And then I want to read it to you from the message. Out of the NIV, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. I love this next part. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that He may send the Christ who has been appointed for you. Let me read that out of the message. He says, now it's time to change your ways. 
Turn your face to God so He can wipe away your sins, pour out showers of blessing to refresh you, and send you the Messiah that He prepared just for you. Do you know what's cool about that? Is it doesn't matter where someone is in life, where their walk of life is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where your walk of life is or your walk of life is. You know what I can say? You know what? Jesus was designed just for you. God is going to refresh you because His Son was designed just for you. God is so good that if you're crippled all your life, never succeeded, always been abused, failed at everything you tried, stood up, fell down, been a beggar, used people, never said thank you, He's got a Jesus just for you. What a cool promise. And that Jesus just wants to bring refreshment on you. Wash you. The good news in community is nobody has to stay ignorant because there's a Jesus just for you. No matter where you are in life, no matter who you encounter in life, that's the beauty of, of having the Holy Spirit work in you. Is because when you start living a God-honoring, people-loving life, and someone comes into your life, the Holy Spirit shows you how to show them the Jesus that was sent just for them. Just for them. Wow. I'm encouraged. This is good news. I should preach this to me. Stand up with me, please. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and, and bow your heads, and not out of religion or tradition, but, but just because I want you to dial in on your own heart for a couple of minutes. I want to wrap up quickly. But I want you to dial in on your own heart for a couple of minutes. So don't, don't bow your heads and close your eyes out of a tradition or religion. Don't do that. Do that so you can zero in on you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask you two questions right now. And the first one is this. I want to be sure if there's anyone in this room that today you need the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. If today's the day that you're going to ask Him into your life to change who you are. Today's the day you repent, turn towards Him, and say, refresh me with that Jesus that has been sent just for me. If today's the day where you, you are ready to give your heart to the Lord, change your life, we just slip your hand up where you are and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Because... Man, I want to become a part of that community. I, I want that refreshing. Just for me, Jesus relationship. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, listen. I'm going to ask everyone in this room to repeat a prayer after me. I want everyone to repeat after me. And then I'm going to ask you one more question. But I thank you for, for, the, for the one that raised their hand. And, and I want to be sure that we take time to celebrate that. So we, just with your heads down and your eyes closed, we repeat after me just right now. Just, just repeat this after me. Jesus. Come on, everybody. Jesus. Today. Change my life. I ask you for that refreshment, that joy that I know you have just for me. I repent. I choose to change my life. And I need you to help me. Please forgive me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That is so cool. Now listen, while you're still in a posture of prayer, listen. Heads down, eyes closed, listen. Will you right now, between you and Jesus, will you make a commitment to Jesus that you, that, man, this is the end of our, our community series and we're starting an exciting one next week, but 
as we conclude community, will you make the commitment right now before we leave this room that you will, you will build community outside of Midtown, but you will serve and love the community of Midtown. Right now, I'll repeat that. We make a commitment to Jesus that says, I will build community outside of Midtown, but I will serve and I will love inside of Midtown. Father, I love you this morning, and I, I'm, I can't even express how excited I am about what you're doing in this city and, and in this church and in my life. But I pray, Lord, we will be a church that is all about community. We will, we will see that church of Acts and how they built community, and that we will not just have a, a simple four-week series, but we will be a people that influences everyone we meet towards Jesus. And we'll be a part of that community. I love you, Lord. Show us this week that beggar that we need to reach into their life and help them stand up. Show us that beggar that you've put in our path that we've ignored all along. Show us this week that one we could come alongside that, that we perhaps have judged, but we realize now that it's just ignorance. Show us this week how to build community outside of this church and to love and to serve inside of it. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Midtown, God bless you. Have a great week. Don't forget, Wednesday night is FPU. You're an amazing group of people. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, was, is, is to come. For creation I see, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything.